If I haven't gotten to meet you yet, my name is Olivia. It's so great to be part of this church with you and get to know you. And one of my favorite things in my life right now is being part of a Wellspring community. So we haven't been announcing these because they're like almost done, but a couple times a year we go through like an eight, ten week stretch of Wellspring communities, which are dinner parties where we discuss the sermon and apply it to our lives and pray together and eat together. My Wellspring community is the best one. It's the Court Square group uh, with Jenna and Travis, and I've just been loving it every single week. Um, This is the last week, so it's too late to sign up right now. Coming soon, back in the fall again. Um, But in our Wellspring community last week, we had a great conversation about what kind of safeguards can we put in our life to protect us and prevent us from having the same fate as Samson. And one of the recurring answers that started coming up almost right away in that question of safeguards was social media. People saying boundaries on social media is a really, really practical thing you can do to protect your own soul. And, uh, you know, that resonated with a lot of people. It's an area you got to be really careful. And uh, one of our friends, Danielle, phrased it in a way that just will always stick with me. She said, when you go on Instagram or Facebook, you need to picture 10,000 Travises in a room trying to get you addicted to this app. He's a data engineer in our group as well. I just pictured 10,000, the exact same face, all sitting there, just how can we get Olivia to never get off Instagram? A <laughs> uh, little bit eye-opening. Oh, my gosh. Scary. It's a scary place out there. Uh, and so you got, like, the engineers, you got the Travises out there trying to get you. And then you got... <laughs> And then you got the influencers out there as well. Have you ever had a friend who's turned into an influencer? It's a weird thing when you're millennial that you like grow up with someone, you know them well, and then one day you realize their social media is getting really aesthetically pleasing. And then you're like, wow, how do they have so many followers? And the next thing you know, they're promoting some product. And you're like, if you don't pay attention, you start to think they mean it. (laughs) Uh, I have a good friend named Acacia, who I grew up with her, went to high school with her, love her dearly. Um, really loved being her friend on social media and seeing her kids grow up and her nice home and all that. And then she started sharing about this dry shampoo. And I was like, she's got great hair. I should get this dry shampoo. (laughs) And so I got this dry shampoo and it was fine. Um, But it really took me, this is like, you know, 10 years ago or so, early Instagram days. It took me a while to actually realize, she was getting paid to do that. (laughs) She didn't really mean that. She was just making money off of me. So you got the Travises, you got the influencers. Uh, Influencers are leaders in one way or another. Uh, Most of us, myself included, don't really love being told what to do, someone trying to convince you to do something. But if they just do it and they start to tell you how great it is, they start to influence you and it changes your decisions. Next thing you know, you're actually following somebody and doing what they are telling you to do. They're leading you. Now, this is actually a leadership um, technique. It's wisdom to leaders to say, don't tell someone what to do, just influence them. Start to guide them, start to encourage them and draw them in with influence. So Samson has been our main focus for the last few weeks, and Samson was a leader. He was a judge of Israel but there were influences in his life that were actually leading him. Hey there, Delilah. We're going to read this story today from Judges chapter 16. And there's a whole conversation before this that we're just going to skip over to get right to verse 15, right near the end of their relationship. Judges 16, 15. Then she, that's Delilah, said to him, How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you have made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he told her everything, She sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he has told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. 
Then she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they sent him to grinding grain in the prison. But the hair on his head began to grow again after it had, it had been shaved. So when we think about influences in our life, I'm going to label this first category of influences Delilah's. There's Delilah's in our life. I love to preach about women in the Bible. I love it when women have a name in the Bible, and I love to see the positive in them. There's not much positive to see here in Delilah. It's not a compliment to be called a Delilah. There's not much redeeming about her. And here's a few attributes of Delilah's that might be influencing you. Number one, they are attractive to you. Samson was in love with Delilah, it says. He was drawn to her. He liked her. He thought she was cute. He was into her. Delilah, they think, comes from the word Layla, which means night, where Samson means sun. So this interesting light drawn to the darkness. She's often described as a prostitute, although it doesn't actually say that she is. It's possible. It doesn't even say she's a Philistine. She could have been a Hebrew woman who was bribed by the Philistines. We don't actually know. But what we do know is that Samson was really into her. People in your life that you are drawn to. Second quality of Delilah's is they don't actually love you. So it says Samson loved Delilah. It doesn't say that Delilah loved Samson. In fact, her actions would show that she didn't care for him at all. She didn't care about him. She was using him. She didn't actually love him back. People that you're drawn to who do not have your best interests at heart. Quality number three, they're in it for the money. So we don't actually get the impression that Delilah hated Samson or wanted to kill him. She didn't have like a personal vendetta against him that she's like, I just want Samson to die. But the Philistines said, we will give you silver if you show us the secret of his strength. She wanted the money. If she was a good Philistine woman. Why did she need a bribe to subdue the enemy? But she wanted the money, and it was a huge amount of money. Delilah's in our life are those who are using us to get something. They draw us in. They don't actually care about us, but they want to gain from us. Number four, their goal is to subdue. This word is used again and again and again in their interaction, to subdue or weaken. It reminds me a little bit of um, in Rocky, the Rocky movie, uh, where his coach says, women weaken legs. <laughs> Samson is this strong man, but this woman comes and just like weakens right in her presence. The goal is to subdue. This is their conversation they have that's recorded all throughout Judges 16. Um, she comes to him four times to say, what is the secret of your strength? She's quoting the Philistines directly, what's the secret of your strength? Doesn't work out. She says I, that you may be subdued. The second time she says, you lied to me, you ridiculed me. What's the secret? So that you can be tied down. The third time she says, you ridiculed, you lied to me, how can you be tied down? And this time he shares a bit about his hair. Seth talked about this last week, gets a little closer to the right answer, tying it in a loom. And it's the fourth time that she actually gets a little deeper, not just, you lied to me, you ridiculed me, but she says, you don't actually love me. And so this is the fifth point about Delilah's, they gaslight you when you try to set boundaries. The fourth and final plea, if you really loved me, Samson, you would do this to me. And it says, Samson was sick to death of her nagging, which is a little bit of like a dark foreshadowing of what's to come. In all this conversation, the word binding is mentioned three times. Love is only mentioned one time, although love is the Achilles heel that gets him in the end. And he knew that he was a Nazarite. He knew that his strength depended on God, so he told her the truth. My strength comes from God. And that's what does him in. Delilahs don't care about you. They want you to get weak because they want to take something from you. And when you try to say no, they start to gaslight you. You know what that means? 
to make you feel bad for having a boundary, start to make you feel bad for having a standard, make you question everything. Oh, I do love you. Oh, I guess maybe you're right. This can look like a lot of things. Here's like kind of a, a very simple example, not so drastic as Samson and Delilah. I remember a couple of friends of mine hanging out, and uh, one of them was always complaining. He was just like Debbie Downer, always seeing the bad in every situation. And it just kind of like, over time, you're like, oh, you try to just be nice and let it happen. But I remember eventually, one time, this friend complaining, and our other friend saying, hey, you know, let's have a positive outlook. Let's try to be grateful for what we have. And the complaining friend got so offended. Rather than saying, you know, you're right, you're right, you're right, I should be grateful. He came back with, you think you're holier than me, you think you're better than me, <laughs> how dare you say that to me? I'm allowed to share my feelings, it made him feel bad. You think that you're so much better than everybody else. Just trying to have a standard, trying to say, let's, let's actually do what God wants. and make you feel bad for it. So what's a person to do with Delilahs? First of all, um, avoid them. <laughs> avoid Delilah time. Now, let me just preface this by saying I don't recommend jumping to the judgment, so-and-so is a Delilah. Uh, all people are beloved by God and usually are a mix of good and bad intentions. You have, may have been a Delilah in someone's life and you weren't even aware of it. We don't go around judging people, putting them in this category. But when you start to recognize this pattern, these five things going on in a relationship, I'm drawn to them, but they don't really seem to care for me. They may have ulterior motives. They're weakening my resolve. They're making me go against my conscience, and they make me feel bad for having a standard. It is right and healthy to pull back a little bit from your deepest relationships. This is not someone you're trying to evangelize to necessarily, but someone that you're letting in to the deepest corners of your heart. It's okay to say maybe they're not safe. Now, in Samson's case, it was lust, right, that he was drawn to her. He was, like, sexually attracted to her. It obviously could be that, that you're around someone that you just cannot control your hormones when you're with them. And you got to realize this is not good for my own soul. It could be a little more innocent than that. It's just flirtation. But when I'm with them, I get a little carried away with the flirtation. And it's not right, and I know it, but it just doesn't seem so bad. But it could also be non-sexual. It could be gossip. It could be someone that whenever you're with them, they draw you into talking bad about other people. It could be rage. When you're with them, you start to get angry and hate people. It could be doubt. Someone that whenever you talk with them, they try to make you question God. And not in like a healthy dialogue way, but in a way that you just get pulled into a pit. Or they make you feel fear and anxiety when you're around them. 1 Corinthians 15, says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. You do got to be careful who you spend time with. And uh, so avoiding Delilah time is like probably the top recommendation from Samson's life. If he had just not hung out with her, a lot of things would have gone better. Now, it could be a person. It certainly could be a person online as well or in any kind of media, books you read. Shows that you watch, that's where a lot of communication is fed into our souls. It could be an account online. It could be an entire app that you realize, wow, when I'm spending time with this communication stream, this is not healthy for my character. So avoiding it and pursuing wisdom instead. Samson was a judge, but he had terrible judgment. He made really unwise choices. We've been reading Proverbs the last month in the Mana Course, for those who are tracking along, reading through the whole book of Proverbs, and there's this contrast of these two female metaphors that keep coming back. One is the adulterous woman or the seductress, and the other one is Lady Wisdom. And they're both these female examples. One lures you in to trap you and ruin your life. The other one calls out in the streets. It says, Wisdom calls out in the streets, come to my home and I'll feed you and I'll teach you and I'll take care of you and give you health and give you life. Avoiding the Delilahs, but also pursuing the wisdom. So Delilah, uh, again, didn't seem to have a personal vendetta against Samson. She didn't even try to kill him, but she handed him over to the influences in her life, the Philistines. 
and they brought him back to Gaza, a place that he had just broken the gates of, and they brought him to grind grain in a mill. If you've been reading this story with us, you may recall Seth told a crazy story last week about Samson having vengeance on his enemies by tying the tails of foxes together and lighting them on fire and sending them into a grain field to destroy the crops. It's a crazy true story. So isn't it interesting that Samson had just destroyed their grain fields, and now they said, you are going to be a slave and you're going to work our grain fields. Revenge back on him. So Delilah's being influenced too. Let's read what happens next, verse 23. Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their god, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God, saying, Our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste our land and multiplied our slain. While they were in high spirits, they shouted, Bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he performed for them. So Samson was influenced by Delilah. Delilah was influenced by the Philistines. But in verse 23, we see a glimpse into an even more powerful force behind the Philistines. Delilah's are attractive to you, but here's a quality of Dagon's. They are invisible to you. While Delilah was attractive and the Philistines were scary and intimidating, Dagon was a spiritual power that probably Samson was not thinking about at all. An invisible force. And number two, while Delilah didn't care about Samson, Dagons actually hate you. They're merciless when you're at your lowest. Delilah said, like, doesn't really love you, but Dagons actually are merciless toward you and want to destroy you. So cruel. Samson was already weakened, already disfigured and blinded, already enslaved, and now he's being tortured. They bring him out as entertainment. Last week, Seth one of his points was don't minimize your enemy. And so I think it's important to remember again that there is an enemy who actually is merciless and hateful and cruel. And number three, while Delilah's are in it for the money, Dagon's are in it for the slaves. This is really what the enemy is after. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus says. And in 1 Peter, we read, the enemy, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. I don't want you to feel fearful in this, but scripture does tell us to be mindful, to be aware that there is a spiritual battle going on that we cannot see. And the goal of that enemy of ours is that we would be enslaved, that we would lose our power, And ultimately, number four, their goal is to undermine God. It wasn't just about Samson. It wasn't just about getting back at Samson. It was all that Samson represented as a judge of Israel. The enemy does hate you, but he is not obsessed with you. Don't flatter yourself. He desires that God would be mocked, and you're just a pawn in that bigger battle. But, Number five, what we see about these dark forces is they will soon be crushed. They are destroyed by the end of this story. Romans 16, 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. One of my favorite verses. Not how you think it's going to end. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. We are not afraid. So here's what happens next as we move on in Judges. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars, because he's blind, that support the temple so I may lean against them because he's weak. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there. And on the roof, there were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. 
Then Samson reached toward two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one, his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. That's the famous moment, right? Well, there is one stronger than Dagon, and he is our defender. Yahweh is his name. He is the Lord. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And one thing that we know about our defender is that he responds to prayer. He responds. When his children cry out, he responds. It's about the only good thing Samson does in his life is when he's in danger, he cries out in prayer and asks for help. We talk about this in our group as well, and we're like, actually, we can judge him for that because he didn't pray enough consistently. But it's a good thing when you're in crisis to cry out to God for help, and God responds. In Hosea, God is described as a mother bear who was robbed of her cubs. It's one of the most terrifying images of God. When his kids cry out and ask for help, he rises up like a mother bear and defends them. He responds. My own child asks me for a lot of things, and sometimes I say no, and sometimes I say yes. But if he's in danger and he is crying out for help, I know the sound of that cry. It's a different kind of a cry. It's not a whine. It's not annoying. It is a desperate plea for help. And that's when a mother bear comes running. And I swear I could hurt somebody if need be. Well, Delilah is in Samson's ear. The Philistines are in Delilah's ear. The demonic false god of Dagon is in their ear. But who's in God's ear? Samson. He prays to God, the ultimate influence, the ultimate power, the one who could change everything, the ultimate leader. Samson is in his ear. Could I influence what happens now by actually crying out to God? The sad, enslaved, damaged man who can barely stand up anymore. The centerpiece of mockery, humiliated. The once proud man who fell from grace. The weakest man in the room with no influence, a room full of thousands of leaders. But he is God's ear. God responds to prayer, and he even responds to bad prayers. Samson's prayer is not that noble. He's still dominated by self-interest. He doesn't say, like, God, that you may be glorified, or for the sake of your people. He's just like, let me get vengeance because they took my eyes. It's his own revenge. It's not a very noble prayer, and yet God still responds. I am so encouraged by that. The number of times I've prayed, like, really pathetic, weak prayers, I'm just like, God, I just, ah, ah. he still responds. God's ear is open to listen to those who call to him for help. Who's in your ear? Friends, are there Delilah's whispering in your ear? Are there dark forces that hate you that are whispering in your ear? Get in God's ear about that. Real influence is found there in the place of prayer. Not in beauty, not in attractiveness, not in political dominance, not in ownership, not in worldly power, but in prayer. That is where real influence happens. That's where real change happens. If you want to be an influencer, pray for people. So some of us right now in this room are upstream from Judges 16. We're still largely safe and healthy, but starting to be unwise in who we let in to whisper in our ear. What voices are whispering to you? What content are you receiving that is unwise to your own soul? Have you learned to discern and refuse to be led by those voices which are destructive to your soul? So avoiding Delilah's and pursuing wisdom, get in God's ear about this. If you're upstream from Judges 16, in James, we read, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God 
who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. What an encouraging verse. So if you're trying to figure out, is this Delilah in my life? Is this unhealthy? Is this dangerous? Do they really care about me? I'm not really sure. I feel confused. Ask God for wisdom, and he will give it. Some of us are there. But some of us might honestly feel more like Samson at the end of Judges 16, defeated, tortured, enslaved, broken, humiliated, unable to stand. The enemy has largely had his way in your life, and you just feel like, I have been destroyed by his attacks. I've been a victim to the hate of the enemy, and I have nothing left in me. Get in God's ear about that, too. Getting out of impossibly dark situations. The only way is by crying out to our defender. So we're going to respond now in prayer. I will invite the worship band to come back up. And I want you to consider I want you to consider where are you in this story? And I want you to consider when was the last time that I cried out to God to save me? If I've learned anything through the last few weeks in Samson, it's that I'm more like Samson than I thought. It's not the first biblical character I identify with. Uh, but over the time, I'm like, wow, I actually definitely relate to his default of I can handle this. I'm strong enough. I got a lot of capability. I don't need any help. I can just keep pushing through. But when you're at your lowest and you realize, actually, I'm not that strong anymore. That's where God can show his real power. So I want to invite you to stand. I want to pray over you. And as always, you're welcome to respond just in worship, in your own seat, just between you and God. You're also welcome to come forward and kneel if you want to like make a step forward just between you and God. Or we do have prayer teams on both sides. If you're like, I need someone to cry out with me. I actually could really use some prayer. I'm being attacked. I've been harmed. I don't know how I'm going to get through. We would love to pray with you. And I just think it's important today to remember that there's a lot more going on in the invisible world than we know. And I've become aware this week of how many things we think are somebody else's issue or like they're just some kind of a, a challenge we're facing, that it's actually a spiritual battle. And if we could have eyes to see that there is a spiritual war going on, how it would change the way we approach these things. It really matters that you be whole. It really matters. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you to come. and to lead us. I thank you for the seasons where we feel weakest. I thank you for the times that we feel most desperate. And I pray now for anybody in the room who is in that place that they feel very aware of their own need. And I ask God that you would come to their defense that you would come and rescue them. That you would come and save them, Lord, out of the bondage, out of the pain. God, come and rescue those who just need you to come and rescue them, I pray. And give wisdom to those who could avoid it still. We put all of our confidence in who you are, God, that you are the defender of the weak. That is who you are. You're the God of peace who will soon crush Satan under our feet. We put all of our faith in you, all of our hope in you. And I pray you'd bring us even right now to the end of ourselves that we realize I have no power of my own. I just need God to come and fight on my behalf. Will you come and give victory today, Lord? We come and give rescuing today, Lord. 
Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to cry out. Teach us how to ask for help when we need it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about our church community at wellspringchurchnyc.com.